Good morning. Thank Good morning. you for being here. Shaka Jin, I don't know what I'm picking my cake and should drink what's a tight weenie and I see Cho, Chiefs, Elders, um, people of the Hone, Haudenosaunee lands. It's so good to be here. Thank you, and thank you to Sear for organizing such a great conference with some great people on some great homelands of, of uh, the Mohawk people. It's so good to be here. Um, I've been always inspired by lead your leaders uh, over the years. I remember in the early 80s when I became the, a leader, a member of Legislative Assembly in Yukon, and I was sent to by our minister to Denver, Colorado at a big world wilderness congress. And I'm sitting there shaking and, uh, and I'm speaking and they put myself and Oren Lyons and a wonderful elder who was in his 80s from Africa um, up on the panel. And I was up to speak and I'm shaking and I said, oh my God, I'm so scared. Oren looks at me and he says, just remember where you came from. And that was all I needed, and I, I never ever forget that. Thank you for that. And then over the years, I've worked with Henry Lakers. What a wonderful brother. And uh, you guys have been so educated in your traditional ways, and I so appreciate that. And I've learned so much from you guys. Henry and I go way back, gosh, <laughs> we're old now. <laughs> we go way back, we used to fight government. Like when under, we were under the FN environmental program way back when, and, uh, and um, we were fighting in Europe at that time, the big fur movement. And um, that was one of our projects on the environmental committee at that time. And uh, gosh, we fought, re fought really hard, and uh, we um, and for many years, and uh, and then we lost. We lost that fight. Um, they took over the lands where I come from. It used to be so vibrant with animals and muskrats everywhere, and we go trapping, and all the families would be out on the lands, and and uh, nobody goes anymore, hardly. And uh, the land is no longer vibrant. The muskrats have overpopulated and died, and then a whole chain of events have happened and uh, create a great depression. In my homelands and uh, so that's the kind of fight we fight over the years and for many years and now we then we created the uh, Aboriginal traditional subcommittee that uh, worked to with the government of Canada on Kosiwi to bring traditional knowledge to the um, to the uh, uh, the assessment of endangered species there's over 600 species that are endangered in Canada a lot of them are edible species of indigenous peoples in this country. And Henry and I fought hard for the government to recognize us, to bring us into that process. Gosh, it took us 20, 30 years to do that. And we finally have that committee, and then Henry leaves. <laughs> Honestly, the chiefs of the Mohawk Nation, we want him back. <laughs> Just a lot, and I remember. And I'm sorry. I used to tell you, shut up now. <laughs> now our committee is so quiet. <laughs> oh, <it's like> <laughs> this is uh, just basically the organization we co-founded, and uh, we do very community-based research. Like I said in my introductions this morning, and our priorities that are laid out by the First Nations people in the territory are food security, climate change, youth injury prevention, diabetes prevention, healthy lifestyles. And of course, uh, we're now bringing suicide prevention into the equation. <laughs> um, next slide. The Yukon is the most rapidly warming region, one of the regions on this planet, besides another region in, in Russia. And uh, Old Crow is the most northerly community where I come from. And um, we're 60, we're situ situated way up there, right there. And we're about 60 miles within the Arctic Circle. And the Gwich'in Nation extends into northeastern Alaska, our village of Old Crow Yukon, <coughs> and down over into the Northwest Territories. We're about 7,000 strong still. Of course, we were uh, way stronger than that years and years ago. We've been fighting big oil now for 24 years since Ray the Reagan administration. They wanted to open the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge where our porcupine 
here with Cass, right in the heart of that. And we've been fighting that for years, traveling coast to coast to the United States and bringing a lot of awareness. We went through several presidents and everyone has um, um, so far, um, we've been holding our, holding strong and uh, to the point where we hear that now 80% of uh, the US People, the U.S. public are saying no to opening up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in northeastern Alaska. The next slide. This is uh, one of our elders that had always a profound impact on me as a child growing up in the community. And a few years ago, I went home and he said to me, hard times are coming. One day caribou and fish will be gone. Then what are you going to do? You guys have to teach the younger people how to live in the future. Make them strong again. Only way. And look after our water. Keep it clean. He passed this past fall. He went to rest. Next slide. These are our healthy land, our healthy crow flats. Back until 2007. This is where I was raised. This is some of the most beautiful lands um, I can never describe. They're so beautiful and so much, there were so much animals. Skies were blackened with all of the migratory birds that come from all over the world. Chesapeake Bay all the way to Hawaii to way down all of South America. Everywhere that animals come and uh, birds come and I grew up with them. I grew up with them so close that in the springtime when we go there in April, to June, we recognize each other. And I know which ducks are gonna go where and what they're gonna do and all that kind of stuff. And um, very connected. And uh, one day my grandfather uh, told me, you know, you see, granddaughter, look at all these ducks here that are flying in from all over the world. I don't know where they come from, but you know one day there's gonna be just loon there too. And, not too long ago, that's what happened. Permafrost is melting at a very rapid rate in our country. And these lakes that we're named after, Vantakuchin, people of the lakes, are now disappearing before our very eyes. They're disappearing and uh, draining away, and it's uh, really, really sad, actually. And um, because all the animals go with them, right? They disappear. The muskrats, the ducks, the birds, the caribou, fish, um, beavers. Everything that we live with in those lakes are going away with these lakes, and it's, it's the big ones that are disappearing now because of the permafrost now. And, um, and over here, uh, just over here, Shell Oil had the dynamite in here looking for exploring for oil and gas way back in the 1970s. And uh, my mother was always worried about that place. And sure enough, it broke open. And uh, the lakes drained in one day. Um, the, the lakes that drained are about five kilometers wide, and several feet deep. And uh, those, they're just disappearing. And it's, uh, it, our country is just not as um, vibrant as it used to be anymore. There's just that pair of loons in some of the lakes. And it looks like crack mud. It looks like desert. And this is way up in the Arctic wetlands. Like my brother. And uh, I have to talk about this rice. Uh, next slide. This rice comes from Ontario. <laughs> and I'm cooking it in Crow Flats because in the Aboriginal Traditional Knowledge Committee, I worked with Sue Chiblo and, uh, and then Henry. We, Henry used to uh, encourage us to bring traditional foods so that we can have a traditional feast wherever we meet across the city. And, uh, and we did that. And, and uh, I used to trade caribou meat, and, or we still do that. I bring caribou meat or fish or something from my country. And we trade for, I always trade for wild rice. <laughs> so uh, we get rice from all the way over just in this country. Um, um, that's me making dry meat and harvesting and out on our homelands. That's my traditional home. And uh, 
everything we do now is different. We can't fry meat the way we used to. We can't just hang it out there and <coughs> expect it to dry because of precipitation. You have to work with, uh, you have to dry meat indoors now and in our tents. So we have to put big racks in our tents when we get caribou. And um, so things have really changed. And uh, all the lands where the caribou used to walk are now being covered and overtaken by big willows and big trees. And, um, so things are growing really fast, so it's, it's having a huge effect on the, on the caribou herd that come, that's 170 strong right now still, and that come and visit us every spring and fall when we're on our traditional homelands. Um, so because of the elders' direction in the community, um, we submitted a proposal to Health Canada, the health adaptation program, um, and we got some money to do a food security strategy for my village. That's the next slide. And uh, I know there's some people from Health Canada here, and I just want to thank you guys for, for that. Um, it really helped us to move forward. And we started a program uh, our changing home, our changing land lives, our changing homelands, and we um, help uh, set up a workshop and with the entire community. Well, most of the people in the community in the two in January two thousand nine, and uh, these are our people deliberating at that conference and. Uh, we work with uh, researchers also, the International Coordinator Research researchers that came to our community and our people are very welcoming of research. They always were um, because we sit on some incredible lands like wetlands and, and, and a lot of changes going on so researchers are really drawn to that area. So well, they were there and we took advantage of that and we put everybody in a big circle and, and we asked them basically went around in a circle and ask them, uh, what does climate change mean to you? What's going on in your homelands? What, what are the changes? And every person in that circle spoke. And um, we also, from that, we watched the youth, and we picked six youth who, were, who had some knowledge and wanted to learn more. And then those were the ones that we picked as, as the researchers. They were high school students. Um, so the, this led to, then we did the training of the youth and we created the methodology right at home there on our homelands with them and uh, on, on the recommendations of what the people wanted and what the elders wanted. So then we uh, started the, the next project and this led to the next project uh, after the training part. So what we did was we um, trained the youth on how to do research. We interviewed about 35 people in the community um, immediately, right away, to let them know what we were doing and to, to start to start getting their their traditional knowledge as to what they think should happen as a as part of the food security strategy. Um, we did a community newsletter and find, we do community newsletters as the project goes along so that everybody had a tabletop newsletter with all kinds of pictures of themselves and of the students doing the research and what people were saying. So we, had, we gave those out during the process of the research so that the entire community was engaged. And, um, and then we also did film, we filmed the entire project uh, photo voicing is so very important to indigenous peoples, our people, because it tells tells more stories than words. So we use uh, photo voicing. We did a DVD, and I have a 20-minute DVD on the entire project, and it shows. Um, it was shot over a 15-year period, and shows people living, our people living on the land, and through the entire project. So that's. Um, available, I'll bring it later. I didn't bring it this morning. I kind of didn't sleep last night. So. <laughs> but, um, so that's what we did. And then the next slide will tell us what the people said. That's a high cash, and I know a lot of people in Canada have high cash. Uh, a long time ago, we used high caches to store all the <coughs> meats, and we use them up there a lot. 
We store our meats and fish for long-term storage and our tools and snowshoes and toboggans and things that are made of skin so animals can't get to them. We have them on high caches like that. And so one of the biggest recommendations came through that we needed a long-term food uh, storage facility. Um, we don't have roads up there. We're an isolated village, so we don't have culverts. <laughs> I'm trying to ask <laughs> my friend over there from the Yukon if we could borrow one of those. Maybe we could fly in or something. <laughs> but uh, we need a long-term storage facility to to start storing dry goods um, and uh, emergency supplies and tools and things like that that uh, that people will need. And uh, we're, we don't know how to grow things. We're not gardeners. We're the people of the Arctic and the tundra, right? So we now have to learn how to garden. And we tested the soil. And the soil it has only uh, enough nutrients in it to, for two growths. And then we have to do composting. And we don't eat vegetables. So how are we going to compost? But we have to research all that and figure it all out. And so that's the next phase. And there's also a possibility of husbandry animal farming. So there's chickens and turkeys in the village now. People have flown them in and they raise them. And of course, it's very high cost for a feed for, for those kinds of things. But people do have fresh eggs once in a while in the community and also turkeys um, at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, identification of where all small fish and animals are. Around us is a lot of lakes and rivers creeks and the very high recommendation came from the elders that we started looking at those creeks, checking them out, see if there's fish in there um, and, and start preparing and just check out where the animals are. The next slide. This picture was taken in 2010-2011. We never got fish in Old Crow for a long time. Like one year we only got 100 and we were allotted 150 salmon by DFO. There's 280 people in my village. We only got seven. So, and this year, the Yukon is at 33, 33, 34,000 people in the entire territory. Indigenous peoples, our people live right along the river systems as a lot of everywhere. And this year, we people were allotted 1,500 and we didn't even reach that quota. So salmon is uh, a major staple of our people, and it's it's, uh, it's really sad that we, we're not getting that anymore. This person, this is dog salmon, wonderful salmon that Dr. Adrio spoke about yesterday. Um, we get a lot of dog salmon, and it's there not as much as we used to. This person here that got this salmon has got a big dog team, so he got the fish for his dogs and. Again, he's a young man not understanding climate change and eating all the fish like that because you know you don't have freezer for that much. You have to hang your fish, we've always done that. But the whole community just smell like fish, <laughs> rotten fish because it's, that's the way that they did it, not understanding that you know this is gonna happen. So different different life, different way of doing things totally now with the with our changing homelands. So the next slide. During the last phase, we um, we had uh, focus groups and meetings in Old Crow, um, just to make sure that everybody's aware of what we're doing. We keep going back, we, uh, and we discuss the priorities with them. How is it going to be done? You know, who's going to pay for the long-term storage facility? And uh, and all through that process, we train the youth right along with us. And they did really, they're, apparently those youth now are doing really good in researching for their homework in high schools now. So they become researchers. Um, we talk to people like uh, any renewable resource councils or um, wildlife um, uh, resource people. We talk to elders, we talk to knowledge experts. We know in the community who are the knowledge experts. In for different species, so we sit down and talk to them and got um, got some of their wisdom and documented that. Um, we talked to past leaders and we also had women's groups and we talked to them as well. Next slide. Uh, we talked about how we're going to develop the plans for the long-term storage facility, animal husbandry, building culture and land-based skills. 
We also do fish and wildlife surveys, and make sure that we count everything that we get. Next slide. And then uh, the young people that uh, we trained, they were able to go to Ottawa in February of 2011 and report with, with us, um, with our directors on the projects that they did, what they've learned. One of them went on to uh, attend COP15 in Copenhagen, and this person is now in university and studying to be a researcher. So, you know, you get one out of six, you're doing really good, you know, and, uh, but those other kids are back home and doing their work in grade 12 now, and they're researching and they're making climate change they're, they're, uh, as part of their essays. So I'm really proud of that, you know, and we continue that kind of work. We pass on the knowledge, like the elders said in the beginning, train the kids, train the young people, and that's what we're doing in the, I guess now, um, uh, it's a, uh, really our, it's us, right? It's our responsibility to, to go forward and as we've heard from, uh, from uh, my good friend Orn Lines and from Dr. Atrio and other speakers yesterday that uh, we can do it, we can get together, we can do this, we can move forward, we have our spiritual, our, our spiritual foundation and I think that uh, I think that's going to be the most important thing next slide. I think that's going to be the that's just the DVD that we did. Um, Old Crow is a I don't have those slides here. Old Crow is um, I'm very isolated, so we're dependent on this program called Nutrition North, and it's a flying community, and it's not working very well for us. Things are very very expensive. Some years we get berries, and some years we don't. And, uh, and we have a, people are beginning to see that we're, we're having to become more and more dependent on our homelands. And we're just hoping that our lands will continue to provide into the future. Next slide. And so now it's up to the leadership. You see we created a little community garden and this is my family out in Crow Flats. We got caribou. We were so lucky to get caribou that spring. And um, so the, those are stuff that I spoke about earlier. I didn't have them on this slide here. So yeah, next slide. And about um, last year, uh, Glenn talked about this in his presentation a bit. We had the Alaska Highway between uh, before White Horse and after White Horse. Um, had washed out due to really, really high rains. We have torrential rains up there we never get ever before. Really heavy rains, just like pours for days. And then it's taken out these, uh, the highways that are weak anyways because of permafrost melt. So we had the, we used to speak a lot about Whitehorse, the city of Whitehorse, which is 22,000 people. Um, doesn't have enough food to sustain not only itself but the rest of the communities and sure enough that happens by the time we got to uh, by the time you know people are starting to realize hey we're gonna run out of food here the shelves were already empty in two days and all the stores that's in the city of Whitehorse and then of course the communities that depend on Whitehorse are not getting food next slide and uh, we just got some photos of the empty shelves. And I went to this one store here, there was only Kool-Aid on the shelf. Um, so White Horse was without food and then they, the milk and eggs, and it was the rich people who had money just go there and just load up, right? And of course, our peoples, a lot of our peoples don't have that kind of money. So a lot of our peoples were, were, were left out. So anyways, they brought in Hercules, the shipments of food from the outside. And it was a real reality check for the Yukon. We're now working with the entire territory and, next slide. We're now working with Portland Polytechnic University out of Vancouver to do soil assessments of, throughout the entire territory and to work with the Agricultural Association and um, to create a roadmap road map for Yukon's food systems to increase our ability to be self-sufficient and food secure there for the entire territory and our communities. And this is the picture of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge when it was very strong um, and 
it still is. We still have 170,000 was the last count of our work by Caribou, and this is right in the heart of where uh, the uh, United States Congress is trying to push to open up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for oil and gas development, and we're going to continue that fight. <laughs> <laughs> so,